And so first I want to say thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I am Councilman Chris Nettles, representing the City of Fort Worth for District Number 8. And I want to welcome you all out today to our conversation. We're so excited about this, uh, this future project that's going to happen. And let me articulate that again. It's going to happen. And so I will tell you, uh, David Cook, our city manager, has dealt with this piece of property since he's been on, on, on with the city of Fort Worth. And so he knows how important this is to make it happen. And I want to tell you uh, that the city of Fort Worth is strongly committed uh, to seeing this through the finish line. So tonight you see our city management staff, uh, you see our communication staff, and our economic development staff that's all here tonight to hear your concerns, your, uh, your thoughts. And what I also like about this is that you have our community partners. So you see a lot of our community partners who are also invested into the 76104. This piece is so important. I tell you, as we look at the uh, development that has happened in the city of Fort Worth, and I'll be really frank because I get a chance to talk about our district, is that 35 has been a dividing line in development. We have seen so much things happen. And we're, we're grateful for what has happened in their south side, the Magnolia, West 7, but it's time to have some things happen on the east side of 35. And so tonight we're going to see that vision come to play. And so we're excited about this new development team, and you'll hear more about that as they articulate their vision. But our vision is very clear. It's to make sure that this community not only continue to thrive, but thrive again. And so we have had so many uh, great experiences up and down Evans. When you talk about the Brooks, you talk about William McDonald in the historic South Side. We have had history here, and so we're getting ready to make history again. And so I'm going to use that piece of my time. They gave me five minutes, but I'll give you two minutes back so that we can make sure um, that we uh, respect the time. So at this time, I'm going to ask the man, Mr. Robert Stearns, to come, who has been really faithful and diligent in this project. And I will tell you, we have had so many hard conversations and sat in rooms together and, you know, and I, you know, uh, but we understand the process. And so I want to thank Robert uh, for sticking to uh, what we're trying to do on the on south side Fort Worth. And so without further ado, Robert Stearns. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. And I won't take up a lot of your time either because I want to make sure that we maximize our opportunities to meet with the development team, Royal Capital. Uh, but I will say one thing. One, thank you all for coming out tonight. It is, it is great to see so much involvement uh, so many people that want to see this project move forward. When we had our last meeting, we told you all we were committed to getting a new development team in and we're committed to doing this right. Uh, we had an RFEI out there. We had 11 proposers responded to it. We had some really great teams that we looked at and through a combination of a selection process that included city staff and, and members of the Historic Southside Neighbor Association, we selected Royal Capital. And I, I can just tell you, in the... 30 or so days that the Kevin and his team have been involved, uh, it has been a breath of fresh air for us. Uh, he is really, I'm not going to hype you up too much, Kevin. I'll tell you, it, it, has been, it has been a real pleasure with working with him and his team, and I'm excited about what the potential holds for this site. So again, as the sign says, momentum is building. We want to keep that momentum moving forward and bring this project to fruition after a long, long 20 plus years that we've been working on it as a city and even longer than that, that the community has been waiting for development to happen. So with that, I will turn it over to, who am I turning it over to, Martha? Lorraine, Miss Lorraine Miller. I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Oh my goodness, good evening everybody. It was just, I looked, I was sitting back there and it was just a few and now it's a whole horde of people. As we say in the church, praise the Lord, everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you, each and every one of you, for coming out. This is so important, and this is a good thing. So we're going to move our show along. Now, this is what we hope this evening. You walk away. When you walk out the door, you know what we're doing. You kind of know what the plan is, and you know what the developer looks like. Okay. And so if we can accomplish that, I think we'll have a good informative evening. Now, part of 
if you know anything about the historic South Side, our logo is the Sankofa bird. You know, so you know the Sankofa bird looks back, right? So we as a community are looking back at our past, but the Sankofa's bird feet pointed to the future. And so we're moving forward. With that, we're going to ask Jan Higgins, who is the historian for the historic South Side, to come up, give you a little five minute, Jan, five minute prelude. Hey there. I am coming to you on behalf of the Historic Southside Neighborhood Association as well as the Lenora Rolla Heritage Center Museum. I'm on the board there, located at 1020 East Humboldt Street. Come around and see us. We have a YouTube channel uh, called TarrantCountyBlackHistory.com. I'm excited to be here with my two cousins because this neighborhood is near and dear to my heart. I've been here all my life. I went to kindergarten right in this room in the 1960s, so that means I'm real old. <laughs> so um, we can start with the, the, a, a brief overview of the black history of this neighborhood. I want to say that it started with William Madison Booseneck McDonald. Because in 1906, this man decided that he wanted to build a grand three-story mansion uh, on the corner of Terrell and Tennessee Streets. And he wanted that mansion to be an exact replica of the house where his father was enslaved. So that's what he did. If you look at one of the videos on our YouTube channel, you'll know that William Madison McDonald is a black man who came from Terrell, Texas, joined the Republican Party, made friends with a bunch of rich white people, uh, ended up as a Mason, and all the Masonic lodges in the state of Texas were depositing money into the Fraternal Bank and Trusts, which is what he established and owned downtown on the corner of Ninth and Jones Street, where the Trey Transportation Center is right now. So when Mr. McDonald came in 1906, built the mansion, you can look on the 1910 census and find him with a servant living high on the hog right there on Terrell and Tennessee in 1910 in the census. So the other thing he began doing was going into foreclosure auctions and getting distressed property here in this immediate neighborhood. He would then take that property and sell it to black residents and give them a loan through the bank and make sure that they qualified when they couldn't qualify anywhere else to buy a home. And so as he slowly did that, he, he you know, constructed hotel downtown and uh, uh, the uh, uh, gym hotel and, uh, you know, restaurants, clubs, etc. So a lot of black businesses sprung up right here on Evans Avenue as a result of loans that Mr. McDonald was able to give people that couldn't get loans anywhere else. So he's my hero, and he's like the beginning of the Terrell Heights neighborhood. So I have asked my cousins, who are also a wealth of history, if you ever talk to them. This is my uh, first cousin, Arthurine Jackson, Lee, Arthurine Lee Jackson, and her family, as well as Jean Ransom's family. They own the, the property uh, on which we are sitting right now, back way back when, and they're going to talk a little bit about it. Bye. I'll let you talk about Aunt C. <laughs> I grew up on the corner of Evans Avenue and Rosedale, next to Mount Zion Church. My grandparents owned the, that land that went around Rosedale. Those were her red homes on Rosedale. And on Evans, um, we lived in the big house, and next to the big house, she built uh, a building that housed Mr. John Turner, uh, John Turner, a, a photographer. Um, was Shadowin in there? Mr. I have Mr. Shadowin, uh, the insurance. The John Eddie's on yours, Chip. Uh huh. Uh, he rented from us. Um, and she had a beauty shop and a barber shop. In the front of the building, after my uncle and aunt moved to Chicago, my dad opened an ice cream parlor in the very front. And he, I don't know if you recall the corner, uh, 
when it was a lot of junk on that corner. The Ian building was my dad's hamburger uh, shop. And I'll pass it over to, okay. I'm Elvia Jean Ransom McBride. My father was the first black doctor to have his own hospital in the state of Texas. He's been honored in Austin, Texas by the medical, um, Texas Medical Association down there, um, along with five others that were historic doctors in other parts of the state. I lived on Terrell Avenue from age zero to age 11 when my father passed away. I went to live with my grandmother on Evans and Rosedale in the big house, as she calls it. <laughs> Our house was just as big, so. <laughs> but um, I lived with her until I got married at age 20 to a U.S. Air Force. And uh, this area was a lifeline. We brought in military GIs that had no place else to go that were black. <laughs> so they came to this area on the bus and got off on Evans and Rose steps. My grandmother and I sat in front of her house every night just about in the summertime and watched them leave from the bus stop, walk up the street, to all the bars and restaurants they wanted to go to, including churches. Yeah. So, we are out of time. Gotcha. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's our time. This was a wonderful place to grow up, and I'm happy to be here, and, and we're all happy to be part of this project. Thank you. Great. Come on, guys. Let's give them a warm welcome. The history of the Ransoms and the Lees. Oh, this is great. Now, there are some empty spots in here with some seats. Y'all come on and get your seat. We are absolutely delighted to welcome I was um, Kevin to our neighborhood. And what we'd like to do right now, as Kevin comes up, I want the members of the steering committee of the Historic South Side and the Economic Development Committee, these folks have been doing this for quite some time. Come on up, Kevin. Stand up, y'all. Quick. So you know these are the folks that have been dealing with this. There's James Walker is our president. But wave your hand, James, so they'll know. Now, my partner in crime when we were on the selection committee, thank you, fellas, was, there you go, Walter. I didn't even have to call you out. Walter and I were partners in crime, I guess. Um, with, we, uh, we have worked closely together uh, as part of the selection committee. And so, ladies and, gen and gentlemen, we're going to welcome Brother Newell. Howdy. Howdy. And so, we're going to ask a few questions, and then we're going to get to you. So, I want you to, don't want you to make a statement. We want you to ask a question, okay? And then we'll just, we'll move this right along. So, Kevin. Yes, sir. Kevin. Welcome, as the little, my little cousin says, off up in here in for what? <laughs> for what? Okay. For what? Um, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and what's your background, your education, and can you share with us kind of how did you get into the real estate development business? Um, I'm gonna say this as as, a, as if it was like a linear okay. path, but you know, it's a lot of uh, you know, uh, you know quality opportunities that came my way that, that led me into real estate. Uh, from a general person standpoint, I'm very familiar with the South. Um, as what I kind of told you, I was born in Mississippi, Greenville. Um, moved to the Midwest, uh, Milwaukee, when I was a, a toddler. And, you know, pretty much, you know, went to traditional schools there. Um, left, um, well, stayed in Wisconsin, went to the University of Wisconsin, Whitewater for undergrad. Just to forgive me. Okay. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> to study uh, uh, undergrad B school. Um, but how I ended up in real estate, though, was actually 
um, the opportunity I had to participate in a program called the Marquette Acre Alum uh, Acre Program, which essentially was a program dedicated to finding ways to uh, get um, minorities involved into real estate development. So um, that program was at Marquette. Okay. Um, so I was doing the dual track program at that point in time, um, doing uh, Whitewater's B School as well as Marquette's real estate program. And so what happened was I was actually coming back from uh, um, Brazil. Uh, my colleagues were um, <laughs> they always coming back from the same trip. It was a study abroad program. When I, so when I graduated from undergrad, I had two opportunities. Okay. Um, I had interned at Coles Corporation, which is one of our primary um, uh, corporations at the time in, in Wisconsin. And they had a job opportunity for me, a uh, full-time job opportunity. Um, but then um, the program in Marquette was set up where the top six students um, got one of six placement, one-year placement opportunities. And you were one of the six? And I was one of the six. Okay. And, um, yeah, you are. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I say, I'm going to say this very in a linear context. It was a lot of hard work, but essentially that's what happened. And the, the placement opportunity was really, uh, for me, um, provided was the opportunity to go work in public finance. Okay. So kind of learning how public finance works from a, a bonding standpoint, tax credit standpoint, you know, infrastructure programs and so forth. So it's just like 06, 07, yeah. you know, dealing with the major uh, crisis that we had going on at, the point, at that point in time. So fast forward, I decided to forego the for the the absolute job and to take this one-year placement opportunity. Okay. Fast forward um, six months into that role in public finance, you know, six months to go. And they decided to say, hey, let's 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 get his kids some opportunity here to, you know, really drive something. Fast forward, stayed it there for three and a half years, uh, really kind of went from asset manager of our risk based portfolio and then um, moving over to the, the front end of the business, more business development side. And then I started World Cap. People always say, like, how did I start the company at mm -hmm. 25, 26? There's a couple of fundamentals that went into that. Obviously, I didn't have any, I didn't have any bills. I didn't have any children or anything like that at the time. I actually just decided to leave because I knew my entrepreneurial spirit was dwindling away. And so being able to fast forward um, through that process and say, hey, I'm gonna start this company, I wanna do it now. Um, it needs to be done now is what I told myself. And I just left it, left the organization that I was at, at the time and I uh, decided to start the company. Oh, good, good. So being in finance yeah. helps you with the real estate development. Does that, that's kind of what- Yeah, if you don't know the money, you don't know real estate. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Great. So, I'm going to ask Walter to ask that second question, Walter. <laughs> right with Mike? Yeah. <laughs> Come on down, brother. Okay. Hey, Kev. What's going on, Walter? Not too much. Um, you and your team are from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And so, what interested you about Fort Worth and this project specifically, or a historic Southside project? You know, I think Fort Worth is a very warm community. Uh, I think that we like Fort Worth more than y'all liked us at first, though. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I think just coming down um, this past January and getting a chance to meet with some of the staff um, and drive the neighborhoods and so forth and kind of get a broader understanding about what Fort Worth is and then getting a chance to enjoy um, the vision that was set out for Everson Rosedale um, being a bit, being able to be a part of an historic neighborhood like this with folks that are really vested, um, is really two sides to that coin, right? Folks always say, you know, you got to deal with the neighbors, right? Yep. But on the other side, if they're not involved, you got to deal with the neighbors, right? So we've always found treasure and idea that folks really who are involved, you got, when you walk into a community where folks have an opinion and they may, their opinion may be tough on you. I would rather have that than a community of folks who don't care, right? community of folks who just don't show up and y'all have packed this room and so all of the energy and so forth that i'm seeing tonight is what i saw when i first came down here um and so i wanted to make sure that you know when i'm looking at my team and where we dedicate our time we always got to go to communities that want to help themselves and so just knowing how you all have galvanized around this opportunity the, the disappointment and so forth um and looking at our abilities to really deliver here um we really suck we really sat down and was like i think we'd be a perfect match now y'all ain't make it easy so I do want to let the crowd know that, um, you know, it, it wasn't a, a process where they just walk, we walked in and they say, here go the keys. Um, the same level of distrust that you all would have, you, you better understand that they had that same level of, you know, I, I, you, you guys are cute, but, you know, I don't know if that's going to be enough, right? So the diligence process that went along with it was, um, 
we can go, I can talk about it a little bit later, but it was, it was very intense. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, it was a national, you know, search process. So I got buddies out of Atlanta that run large development shops as well. They called me and like, Oh man, you got it. So it was a, it was a national search and, um, the diligence was definitely done. And I'm happy that you all selected us as your, your partner on this one. Okay. And we're glad to have you now, you know, we, in this community, well, well thanks. So they can eat. <laughs> so this this project has been kind of in the incubator for what twenty five years. Uh, so it's it's been a while, and so there has been a little bit of um, distrust, I guess, if you. Brother Cook, come on down front. This is our city manager. Come on down. No, uh, I'm good. Okay. So we have, we have been looking forward to this for a number of years. So what kind of experiences, Kevin, have you had uh, in working on projects similar to Evans Rosedale that, um, and the, the kind of outcomes that have benefited those communities? Can you just kind of give us a highlight of that? Yeah, I mean, our shop, um... You know, we, we do a little bit of everything. Uh, we do multifamily. We do medical Speak office. Speak up in the mic. We do multifamily. We do medical yeah. office. Yeah, I know, right? She running a tight ship today, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, you want to get to the people. When, 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 she was, when she was telling the stories, they got five minutes, I knew. It was a tight ship. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, um, we do everything. Multifamily, medical office, you know, commercial retail. Um, you know, we, we, we do a lot of different things inside the space. We just very collaborative. We're very, uh, mindful and thoughtful. Our, our, our core principles are candid, thoughtful, agile. So that kind of helps us to navigate, um, and getting things done in the urban core, um, which oftentimes not very, you know, easy jobs to do. So a couple of examples would be, um, an easy one would be in, in, in Milwaukee, we're partners with the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, so what that basically means is they came in, new owners from New York came in and bought the team. Um, they wanted to acquire all the adjacent land around it to build our entertainment district. They did a national search similar to what you all did, mm -hmm. um, and look for a development partner that could help them develop out the multifamily and the commercial pieces. Uh, so went through a process, obviously, uh, showed up, you know, put forth our plans and we became the first, you know, African-American development team to partner with the NBA team. Okay. Um, and what we did there was basically build out the multi, thank you. What kind of what size of project? What money wise, so, and then so the full the, so the full canvas is a billion dollars. Um, our portion we just did the monster. That's that's including the arena, which is our apartments and so forth, connected to the arena mm -hmm. via Skywalk. So we built out the multi-family and the the gym and some other retail components and so forth in the parking structure for like twelve hundred cars. Uh, so that's what the phase we're at right now. Uh, I got a note in my inbox trying to look at another phase, which we're kind of like. We don't know if we're going to be the best partner on that one, but nonetheless, that's what we've done um, on that type of a deal. But if you go, that's our downtown product, right? That's a, that's a traditional market rate deal. Um, not that complicated on the financial capital stack side. Yeah. But then when you go uh, probably uh, less than a mile north uh, on, our, on our MLK Drive, um, we acquired um, a few city blocks um, in 2000 and probably... 18 or 19, maybe somewhere around there, 19, let's call it. We acquired it. In that process, what we did was we did a extensive search process across the city. We had a partnership with the Medical College of Wisconsin, so similar to your medical district here, um, and our philanthropic partners were in Milwaukee Foundation. Collectively, we came together and said, we are now Thrive On Collaboration. So Thrive On Collaboration at the time was really set up to identify ways that we can be of high impact in urban core with a focus on the social terms of health. Right. And the social terms of health is the new, you know, uh, focal point for most healthcare organizations. They're coming in and they're saying, hey, in our case, we can come in and provide the highest level of um, medical care. But if our patients that we're serving don't have quality housing, access to good quality jobs, transportation and so forth. Partnership kind of. Yeah. So we all doing the same thing, right? I'm building housing. They're doing what they're doing. They need housing in order to make sure their, their patients are successful. Fast forward though, because I'm trying to stay on. I, I, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead. I mean, so fast forward though, what, what, this, <laughs> what, this, what this real estate, what this real estate is though, um, we, the city blocks that we acquired. So it, we, we came in, we bought the historic building, okay. uh, and some neighboring parcels. 
we converted that into the Medical College of Wisconsin Centers Institutes that focus on the social determinants of health. So we have two big floors inside of that building. Um, then we have the Greater Milwaukee Foundation who moved their full headquarters and they focus on racial equity and inclusion. Um, well, racial equity. And so we did that. Their primary tenants, we then included the early childhood education component as a key component of it as well. So birth to three, uh, we have 90 seats in, in, for inside of this area that has certainly just not have had enough seats. Um, so we expanded one group um, and have them now focused on their second phase. Um, we got a job works program up in there, food and beverage and these other things. I'm trying to run through it right now. On the other side of that same building, we have family housing as well as senior housing, as well as housing for medical residents or students who are in residency. Then across the street, um, we just finished up, I was set for that set this part, it's part of that same, I don't feel like I'm rushed now, but no, it's part of that same project. We bought, a, um, we built a high school for 500 kids. Oh, so okay. in this case, these kids were since 2012 graduating at a hundred percent clip. And these are kids who are really challenged, homeless in some cases, all these different challenges in their life. But we, we we've been able to graduate them at a hundred percent clip, um, and get college acceptance letters out of 100% of them. The challenge was though, they were in a school that was a plumber. Um, goodwill with no windows and so forth. So what we did as a community of folks is we um, we, we acquired the site uh, and we raised $30 million philanthropically okay. to build them a new school. So we just turned these keys over to them like a month ago. Okay. And we had a big um, grand opening and so forth. So these kids who used to be performing with no, you know, in, in very stressful environments, now they got a school, they got a music studio, they got a school, they got a gym and all the other kind of stuff. So collectively to answer your question about the money, <laughs> that was like $150 million investment. Yeah. But so, so I hear partnership, partnership. I hear, um, helping you see problems in an area and you try to address them. Um, so quickly just talk to us a minute about your collaboration with the community folks. So you did all these good things. So how was the community? How did they have input in? And I'm going to yeah. pass the mic over to Walter for the next. It's a partner in crime. But, uh, so what, when we bought the sites, we started off with a process of both qualitative and quantitative, basically looking at the economic opportunities as well as the qualitative side of, you know, who, where can we go that will have the momentum to go where we got to go in terms of trying to address the needs we had. And so when we bought the bills in 2019, 2019 or 2020, I forget which one, 2020, um, we had begun the process in 2017 of engagement. Um, so we had pretty much, we didn't start construction until 2022, I think. And so across this time, we was really just gathering information from the community to make sure we was in alignment. So that included us doing, and even in the middle of COVID, office hours, they was virtual office hours. Uh, we would do a um, uh, an information session, just call it a charrette or whatever the case may be, just basically saying, hey, come in and tell us, you know, what it is that, you know, this community needs. So everything that we talked about, the family house and the senior house and early child education, the high school for 500 kids, you know, all these different programs and services and so forth, they really sprung up from the community. I mean, essentially us walking into a room with a big board and say, hey, write what you think you need. And then we can try to see, we can synthesize that information, bring it back to you. And you say, oh yeah, I think that's what we say we want it. And then we can kind of put it into action and build it. Okay, great. Walter. Okay, uh, some of the qualities that helped uh, your team stand out in the selection are the creative approach to development, uh, community, to community engagement practice, and work with minority and business equity firms. You kind of covered that middle one with community engagement, Could you? but could you talk about the other two, the creative approach to development and uh, your work with minority business and equity firms? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, yeah, we, we definitely um, are attracted to complicated deals. We, we do appreciate the challenge that comes along with that. I mean, the capital stack, associated with the deal I just mentioned, probably have 14 different sources. Um, you'll hear Brian Mays, our, our, my colleague that runs our finance capital markets team, kind of highlight some of that. But um, on the construction side and so forth, we always look for opportunity for us to be collaborative. So in that case, we have very limited, um, a very limited amount of prime um, general contractors um, in Milwaukee. Um, but we do have a firm of brothers called JCP um, who in that case probably didn't have experience doing a $150 million transaction. Um, they probably didn't have the buying capacity and other things of that nature, but 
there was another prime that we um, had, you know, some history with um, that wanted to have history with us. Us, I guess you would say this is their first job with us. Um, and we said, hey, we would love to have you as our partner. Um, but here's what we will need to make that happen. And in that case, we brought in um, the conversation at JCP and we said, hey, is it possible that, you know, you can bifurcate some of the transaction or the, the job to them and let them run it? Uh, so not necessarily y'all, you know, you give them a little piece and then they, and they got to report to you. I'm like, can y'all join, do a, a real genuine partnership that we can, you know, re respond to, put it, you guys put it on paper, let us respond to it. And then we can see if it can work, but essentially I'm going to lean towards whatever group can make it work with them. Right. And so in that case, we was able to, um, get folks involved that probably was a little, that, that probably otherwise would have been shut out. So we've been creative in those capacities and making sure that we just don't take the easy route on all of our decisions that if we can do something, we will do something. Okay. Um, I, that's, um, that's good. One of the, we have our, uh, like we have our, um, uh, Fort Worth Metropolitan Black Chamber of Commerce president. Where is Michelle? Well, man, no, I just it. She's gone, Brother Johnson? Okay. They, one of the, we've had a great collaboration with the, the Black Chamber. And this question is kind of uh, something we, as an economic development committee for the historic South Side, have been just kind of talking around and kicking around. This neighborhood anticipates that this project will be an economic engine for growth in this community where spending at Evans and Rosedale boosts minority business and creates jobs. So what we're trying to drive at, you spend a dollar here, a dollar reverberates at Evans Rosedale. Amen, everybody? Amen. All right. So what actions, Kevin, and alignment are needed to help us get this process going like that? In terms of? Just how do we get, how do you envision getting minorities, businesses involved and recruiting, and then how do we turn that dollar over? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a collaborative process. I mean, me and Ms. Green have, have, have had some discussions. Uh, we'll continue to discuss with uh, um, you know, all the stakeholders about ways that, you know, folks can show up. So you, you have to be diligent and intentional. Yep. Um, if you don't, if you're diligent and you're not intentional, if you're intentional, you're not diligent, it won't get done. So we're going to have constant communication. Um, so some of the fundamental communication for us that we've already set up is the website for Evans and Rosedale.com. Um, that's going to be one of our primary channels of communication. Uh, so on there, you can type in your cell phone, um, and there you can have notifications about, uh, be notified via text about things that's coming up. That may be an opportunity for you to bid on something that's coming down the pipeline. That may be a community event. That may be an engagement opportunity, whatever the case may be. Um, it's going to be important for us to you know, publicize that website as a touch point so we can maintain communication with you all. Because sometimes folks just not involved because they just don't know. And so we'll be adamant about the importance of us communicating with you all through all channels that we may have available to us. Um, so as it relates to the other side of the um, the aisle in terms of, you know, how are we going to get these businesses to be um, effective and sustainable? And that's going to be on all of us as consumers, right? So we come over here and we invest dollars uh, alongside um, a high ice cream business or a coffee shop or a group that is, you know, a little bit um, new to the stage, let's say. You know, it's going to be very, very important for the community to show up um, like we did today for Smokeaholics. Uh, having smoke Alex here was a very intentional opportunity for us to really show love to them, support them, put some um, dollars into their business and so forth. And if we continue those kind of things that we will be sustained. We will turn that dollar. But if we end up, if we end up where we build this, this ice cream shop or this coffee shop or all these things that you say you want and you folks ain't showing up, I, hope I got one checkbook, right? So we got to stay local. We're going to have to make sure that we, we hold these businesses up and not just ask for them to hold themselves up. Kevin, will you, will you, will you, for just for a quick minute, just kind of tell us what your vision is and the kind of timetable. How are we as a community going to be able to stay in tune with you, keep up with you? What What are your plans? Because I think what you initially saw as a candidate, then you got the contract, 
and then you start researching us. So what do you see? Yeah, absolutely. So a little bit of like um, information, I guess you would say. So an RFEI is a requ request for experience, not request, <laughs> yeah, expression of interest, right? So RFP is a request for proposals. So the RFEI is basically saying, hey, you come and tell us who you are. Less about the project, we'll get to that. Give me some high level perspective, but more so I wanna get into the background and see if you're capable of being a qualified developer for this community. An RFP process is coming in and say, hey, I done all the work, I got all the designs, I got everything figured out, here's what I wanna do, do you like it? And you guys pick the best proposal. So during the RFEI process, uh, we just came in and expressed who we were and what we've done. Um, and got to know the folks on the committee and so forth and made, they made the decision to select us. So our next steps now is really to focus on the actual development, right? So we have a good idea about what we want to do, but that's the importance of engagement. I don't want to go out here and get the design and the building stuff without talking to you folks. So over the past month or so, we've been doing a lot of engagement, um, getting a chance to know the community and so forth. And so we got a three part um, highlighted engagement strategy where today is the first part, right? Folks get to know me and my team, get to ask some questions and so forth. We're gonna ask some questions of you all. I've been doing that for the past month or so, just kind of engaging. Next month, we're gonna actually have a community charrette. That charrette will be an opportunity for folks to come in and kind of say, hey, um, we like some of these ideas that you put out here today. We don't like this, or we want to add this concept or some things of that nature. That can be everything from. So people will be able to see some drawings or etchings or something. Inspiration. 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 So you'll see the inspirational side of what it is that we're thinking about. You may see, hey, we're thinking about a coffee shop. Hey, we're thinking about a sit down restaurant. Hey, we're thinking about, you know, apartments and things of that nature. A lot of the things you guys have already communicated, we're going to throw it back out there to make sure we're speaking the same language. And then what's going to happen in the month of November, we're going to come back around and say, hey, based upon all the information that we already have, here's a synthesized perspective and here's some plans we want you all to react to. So that's going to be full on renderings, right? That's going to be full on. Here's the complete vision about what we want to do. And then from there, we're going to go into active and um, active, diligent development work. So that's going to be us ensuring the financial capacity um, is there, ensuring all phases of development are, are ready to go. We did a, a pretty... We did, a, we did something on the front end, which is going to add a lot of value. Uh, we selected the engineering team that was on a previous development to help us um, expedite the permitting process. So we worked with the city department already about, hey, we're going to be making some tweaks. Here's some variations of some of these tweaks. So instead of us going through a year process permitting, we can cut that process down. Um, the same thing with the architect. Um, so when we go through this process of, you know, telling the community this is what we want to do and then getting to the end zone, we should be ready to get there more efficiently. Um, so our broader goals is to like take those three steps and then move forward. So there's more stuff coming, more collaboration coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, guys, we want to get to the most important part of the meeting to me is you, your questions. So we're going to ask um, Terrell Walker and Brian Mays, a part of uh, uh, Kevin's team, to join us up here. Walter. Walter. Hmm? Terrell Walter. Walker. He don't like that. <laughs> what did I call you? That's, Walker. That's <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm okay. All right. So you off up in my home today, okay? So yeah. we'll call you. <laughs> call you whatever you want. No, no. Good, good. <laughs> now. What she said. Ladies and gentlemen, what we want you to do is not make a statement, ask a question, and make it pointed so we can get to as many people as we possibly can. All right. Hands up. Who's the first question? <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I'm Sherry Douglas, Chair of the Board of Michigan Public Chamber, and I appreciate what Lorraine and the community have done. Absolutely. Number one, will this be a base project? And number two, how will you keep it cleaned up in this area? Yeah, good question. Um, some of the things that we have learned uh, through this process is, you know, what we always do, we like to come to our, a new development site before we acquire it or whatever the case may be. And we like to drive it during the day, you know, the night, 2 a.m., 6 a.m., kind of see what the flow of traffic is. Um, what we probably didn't know, um, but once we start talking to the community, we learn more about it was the fact that there is uh, 
uh, unhoused population here that can be a little bit, um, you know, tough to get your arms around sometimes, let's say. Um, and so we understand that from an environmental side that um, vacant land and vacant parcels and so forth can be a tremendous challenge for um, development or neighborhood, right? We got, I talked to a young lady today that lives across the street and she said she's been broken in three times. She just bought her home, right? So we're going to be making sure that um, all of that is taken into account. Um, we do understand that a property being vacant for five years longer yeah. can be a problem. And so we're just going to evaluate that. Um, if we're, going to we're going to figure out if it's going to be a phase approach or um, a, a one-step approach. Uh, we got our hypothesis. Um, but at this point in time, we're probably just going to continue to learn a little bit more and then report back to you all um, what we think is best. Uh, yeah, and Terrell Walter, or Walker, if Lorraine says so. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, so in terms of making sure that the site is cleaned up, um, et cetera, um, one thing that, you know, we know is, and, and we've learned, I'll say, over time is once you put more activity um, on the street level, um, you know, activity in a place, you, you are able to capture people in place, have people come by as a destination, you're creating space. Um, you know, you change, you change that perspective, that culture, and people naturally move around in addition to having some security measures in place uh, that makes it safe and feel, you know, walkable, et cetera. So those things will happen throughout the development process. Uh, we'll also be mindful, you know, of those type of items during the construction process so that we can make sure we stay on time on budget. Mm -hmm. Brian, you good? I'm good. Yes, I'm Johnny Lewis. And, and I'd like to know, we have a lot of young men who are not employed, but I'd like to know how you work with uh, some of the schools that have programs that can get embed young, young people into electric, electrician and plumbing programs that you would encourage that. I know you can't hire everybody, but will you work towards some of those young men who are working towards their uh, apprentice, like working on their apprentice license and uh, to work towards those, these other I'm, I'm going to answer it on the front end, and I want Terrell to answer it from the apprentice side and so forth. And so what we've done is um, we've start, we, we tried to be leaders inside of the space of getting folks um, acclimated, assimilated, um, and, you know, get some love from overall real estate world, world let's call it. Um, in Milwaukee this summer, we trained up 30 kids on real estate development. These kids are inner city kids that are juniors and seniors who had no idea about what real estate was. But, but from day one to day, uh, I think they went a six week pro program, you know, they was able to uh, do a market analysis. Um, they was able to do a construction preliminary budget, uh, do a financial pro forma and make a investment pro, uh, presentation about why we should acquire an asset or not. Uh, we also did a program this summer separately for college students where we brought in in partnership with the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago where I'm a board member we brought in 10 interns from across the world, from University of London, um, University of Virginia, um, Fordham in New York, Madison, Marquette. Um, I'm going miss some, some of those schools, but in general, we brought them back to the city, we brought them to Milwaukee to hang around us, per se, for 10 weeks, and we can educate them about the process so they can understand how they can help transform some of these neighborhoods. Because one thing rural capital can do is what we can do. But we also understand what we can't do, and that, that's basically being everything to everybody. Um, so. But we, on the construction side, Terrell can kind of go to some of the fundamentals that what we've done um, working alongside some of our primes on construction. Yeah, and speaking direct to the apprenticeship piece, um, so one of the things we, we do as a best practice is we, we want and we work with the prime contractor to make sure that our construction site looks like the community we're building in. Um, so it's, it's about putting, get, get, getting people to work and good qualified individuals that want to work, right? Giving them the opportunity. So we have self-imposed goals where we're doing apprenticeships, um, et cetera. And those are written in our contracts all the way down to the subcontractor level. Uh, so we have apprenticeship requirements. We're tracking those goals on a monthly basis and creating reports so that we can have open book, um, you know, on how we're, how we're doing. Uh, one of the things that I have to be very transparent about is we can't do that without community. You know, we need to know where the resources are. What are the schools that have pipeline programs? What are the missing links? How can we fill those gaps and create support around the program so that 
not only can we get people to the job site, but we can make sure we have a conducive environment when they're at the job site as well, right? Um, because we're doing we're doing lunches with all the subcontractors to come to the site and say, okay, you know, for all the apprentices, you know, how's it going? You know, are you experiencing racism on the job site? You know, what what are the things you're experiencing so that we can retain them, so that we have long-term growth uh, when it comes to minorities being in construction? Well, everybody thinks that. I'm in charge, but Martha Collins with the city is really in charge. Here you go, Martha. Here's the mic. <laughs> yes, I'm on the Urban with the Federal Women's Association. With a little building across the street over here. You guys come, bring new businesses and everything. Our taxes are going up. Our insurance is going up. So how can you help us? Brian, this might be time for you, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you got it. I'll, I'll tee you up. I'll tee you up. Um, now, Nettles and I had a conversation about this. <laughs> um, I'm not city government. Um, Nettles isn't city government. Nobody in this room controls property taxes, right? Um, but what we do do is we try to be creative where we can. Um, I'm going to tell you a program that we've done in Milwaukee that I can't say we're going to do here, um, but I'll give you an example of how innovative we've been in the past. Um, in the neighborhood of one of those developments where we brought $150 million in a short period of time, um, that was just down the street from another development we probably, you know, um, that, we, that has significant impact on the community, um, we did what they call a um, housing displacement fund. Um, so what that basically was, anti-displacement fund. I'm sorry. Y'all got me. So an anti-displacement fund where the private sector philanthropically came together and said, this is a challenge that we forecast, that we want to be a part of the saw. So this is all the business corporations and so forth. And they said, you know, Ms. Johnson, um, property tax have been $1,000 uh, for X amount of time. And our forecasts say that they may go up $500 um, by the time you guys get done with development because everything is going on. Um, so what we did was we philanthropically set this fund up where basically Ms. Johnson can go to the city and say, here's my $1,000. And she has like a three questionnaire, three uh, question questionnaire from, from that she fills out. And then this fund, um, the operates perpetuity, funds the remaining balance. So she doesn't have to worry about the increase in property taxes. So we've got creative around some of those things, but I want to be transparent in saying that that's not transferable everywhere. Um, that's not a challenge that we can, um, we don't control the property tax or anything like that, but it was something that the councilman and I had a good discussion about because we think there's some other opportunities that can be discussed that, that's probably in his favor. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Let me jump in and say this and be real clear. Thank you for that question. Um, we, those that don't know, and, and property tax is just four ways. You have your Tarrant Regional Water District. That's part of your property taxes. You have your fourth IS school district, which is your biggest property tax. Then you have the city of Fort Worth. And I will have you know, this year we made sure that we did not increase the property taxes. Uh, and each year prior to that, we have lowered the property tax. Now, what the issue is, when you, your house is appraised and you don't contest that appraisal, that's where your taxes may vary. So it's not new development. So when we this was an issue that we talked about, uh, gentrification. No, this is redevelopment. This is going to be growth for our community. It's not going to be a burden to our community. And so I just want to make sure we clarify that. What about that piece about the certain age? Okay. <laughs> yeah. And the homestead. So you have a homestead. And then also, you're able, those uh, senior citizens are able to um, homestead, but also be property tax exempt. And so if you're not property tax exempt, please see my office. We're working uh, with uh, senior citizens so that your homes are not taken. And so that's important. So reach out to my office on that and make sure that you are homestead exempt. Are you giving any stipends for for taxes, paying taxes? No. Cook at? <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> there you are, Brother Cook. All right, questions, questions, questions. <laughs> Hello, my name is Megan Boca. I'm with the Tarrant County Black Historical and Genealogical Society. And I'm curious as to how your development plans uphold historic preservation in the area. Uh, I think that uh, as part of this engagement process, um, you know, we did a 
we've been doing a lot of, you know, looking back. I've never seen a community, quite frankly, that has a uh, museum, Lenora, Rala, Rala mm -hmm. historical museum, let's mm -hmm. call it for now, mm -hmm. uh, that's focused solely on the neighborhood. Uh, I mean, I've, we've been a lot of places. I've, I've seen a museum. They talk about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and everything else, but they talk about somebody that went to T.I., I mean, I am Terrell and uh, yeah. all that. I mean, we're going to have the Juneteenth. Yeah. yeah. We're going to have the Juneteenth in here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, but, in general, but in general, though, I'm, I'm from the outside, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to admit that. Right? I'm, I'm going to admit that. I'm learning. But, it, but the, I may not remember the name, but I remember how it made me feel when I heard about the history that you all have in this neighborhood and the pride. Um, and how you all took time to display it in the museum. I mean, I've, again, I've never, again, I'm from outside, that's what I'm calling everything but what it's called, right? So I was impressed. Um, and so when we asked the question about how do we look to um, preserve some of that, you know, we want to make sure that it's, it's visible during artwork, um, how we look at the design. So we're going to have folks take a look at some of the historical nature of the neighborhood from a design standpoint. Anything we can do from pitch roofs, flat roofs, any way we can add in artwork that you know, shows homage, pays homage to some of the folks who have been pioneers in this neighborhood. We're going to do it. That's going to be the fun part for us. So we're really excited about that. And I'm sorry, y'all. Just give me one more chance. Okay. <laughs> questions, questions. Good evening. I'm Tammy Pierce, chair of United Black Contractors. So I have a question for you. A lot of times with uh, private uh, public partnerships, Black contractors know that now. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of my membership in here, and I'm speaking on behalf of all black contractors that are here, because of the federal laws. So a developer or a general contractor. A little further away from your mouth. A little further away. Okay. There you go. A developer or a general contractor can pick anybody that is deemed a minority. Okay? Uh, however, African Americans in the uh, city of Fort Worth pay 18% of the taxes, but we're less than 1% in terms of the contract awarding. So, sorry. Okay, he corrected me. He says 5%. Um, but, and I'm, I'm not going to argue that. But, but my whole point is that what happens a lot of times, because they can pick, let's say, orange group, orange people or red, anybody that's deemed minority. Um, and that you know, and the business criteria can be picked by a general contractor itself. And a lot of times, we are not due to some systemic barriers. So a lot of times, I and mean, I don't want to call out the different projects. Let's say Diggy's Arena, we didn't get nothing. So we're all excited about an African American developer. Um, I'm going ahead and put out a universe. I would like to see an African American general contractor, and I definitely want to see African American subs. Now we're not saying we want it all. Yeah. But my God, we haven't been getting nothing. So what can we do to ensure that everything is fair and equitable? When you talk about the heritage of this community, the Gooseneck McDonald's, okay? Uh, the first black millionaire in Texas is from this community and also built this community, right? Uh, all the Brooks, we got the um, the families, like, you know, uh, Brooks, thank you. <laughs> Brooks, the Brooks family, and just several families of the blood that's here, how will you be able to ensure that with this project, that black participation is met? Yeah, y'all clap for that. Yeah. Um, you remember we had this conversation uh, when we were building a deal in Milwaukee, and I have to remind folks that I'm black, <laughs> so um, we are mission aligned there. Um, in, in the context that um, Milwaukee is a city that is 40% um, black, 40, yeah, 40 something percent black. Um, I know, right? But it, it's the most segregated city in the nation. And when you say segregated, it's just not geographical. It's segregated by funds and wealth and yeah. health and everything else, right? Same here. Um, so I deeply understand the critical path that's needed in order to get that to change. Because I always tell people, I would be trying to help out issues related to black folks if I wasn't black, because I feel like they're the most disenfranchised group of people um, in most communities for a lot of different reasons, right? And so I, in this case, I think that we will within the laws, yeah. right? There's new Make laws a coming. Effort. Yeah. yeah. 
we want to make sure that we're intentional in making sure that they have the appropriate communication, that they have the heads up, um, that they have, for instance, um, the ability to um, have access to the development team. Um, so that can be, hey, um, I know you guys got the concrete coming out. Um, can you give me some timeline about when that is? Um, that can be, hey, um, I got a crew of X amount of folks that's on the painting, um, okay, that's ready to, for the painting contract, but I know you need more. Is there somebody that you can pair me with? Because I just want 50% of the contract. Um, like it's got only got capacity for X. So again, there's a lot that we can do, but I want to reiterate what Terrell said. Um, we can't do it alone. It's going to be requiring everybody in this room. So if the project fails in that capacity, um, it's going to be because we all failed. Ke Kevin, that, that brings up what happened to us with the previous developer uh, when, when the general contractor decided he was going to let contracts out. Our folks, our contractors didn't know about it in time, and, right. and so it got to be almost a show and tell, right. a false show and tell, because then he stood and said, oh, well, we've already got a thousand subcontractors. Right. Hello? And you got a hundred people sitting in the room, African Americans thinking, well, Shazam. Then they said, we'll give you two weeks to try to get your little contracts together. That didn't make sense. That, to me, was a false show and tell. So that's one of the reasons. I'm, I'm glad you raised that, because that has been yeah. our experience here in, in this neighborhood. OK, next question. Stand, stand up and so and tell us who you are. We know. We are consulting firm here in Fort Worth. And my question is similar to Tampa, but a little different. Are there, will there be dollars in the overall project for consultants like myself who work with developers, who work with general contractors, to make sure that the things that they're asking about actually happen? You mentioned not being from here, there's a lot of nuances to the city, there's a lot of nuances to the neighborhood, and I think there are consultants here who can help you guys with like things like compliance, with things like community engagement, to make sure that the project is successful. I don't know why there will be dollars in the project for everyone. Now, I appreciate the, the question. Uh, from our side and as a best practice, we have, uh, you know, experience in leveraging subject matter experts such as yourself um, on the workforce and inclusion side. Uh, so bringing in individuals to say, hey, here's our goals. Here's what we want to do. Here's our baseline. You know, we want 25% of our contracts to, you know, go to, to, to this group, right? Disadvantaged business, small businesses, whatever categories, right, we outline in terms of our, our business objectives. Um, we formalize that in terms of our agreement, and we then charge right a third party or partner to say, hey, hold us accountable in this way. You have the relationships. Uh, we're working together. We're going to come together and meet weekly about it, um, and here's our plan of action. And okay, now let's critical path and work through it. So that's a long way of saying yes. Uh, you know, we will have dollars allocated as a best practice of ours. We like to stay focused on uh, the development plan uh, while at the same time being in the position to know and have peace of mind that we're doing what we said we would do and agree to in terms of our community benefits agreement. Thanks, Terrell. Now, we're going to take one last hot question, but I want to remind you that there's a save the date. This is an upcoming e community event. So the they call it Enviro. It's Evans Rosedale, E-V-R-O, a block party and a visioning event that will be from 4.30 to 6.30, Wednesday, October 23rd, 4.30 to 6.30, Wednesday, October 23rd, at the Ella Mae Chambly Library. Put it on your schedule, because you want to know what's going on. If you want to know, you got to be there. When? 4.30 to 6.30. I'm an old school teacher, so 4.30 to 6.30, Wednesday, October what? 23rd. Praise the Lord, everybody. One last question. I'm Major Adderway with LSM Consulting. Major Adderway, LSM Consulting. Um, I, I see we are following the prospect of building and they will come. And when we build it, the people we really expect to come first are going to be the business owners. 
My question is, is there an education process being laid out for teaching the small businesses that are in existence in our community or that are coming to our community how to stay in business? We have a lot of people that are running businesses here now, but nobody's educated on how to do the books. Nobody's educated on how to forecast or any of that. So do we have an education program put in place? So I will say, just on the other side of the freeway, there is a large brick, red brick building called the James E. Gwynn Entrepreneurial Campus. And at the James E. Gwynn Campus, there's the DeVoy Jennings Business Assistance Center. And at that campus, you can have workshops on how to start your business, how to get your business plan together. You have funding partners there like Alliance Lending and People Fund and William Mann CDC. So all of those things you're talking about, we want to ensure that we're incorporating the tools that we already have in place to make sure that those efforts benefit what's happening here on Evans and Rosedale. So just because the freeway is cutting through here does not mean that there is not synergy and connectivity between that campus and what's going on here in Evans and Rosedale. That, thank you, Major. I appreciate that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end. This is like 7.01 now, to the end of our evening. I hope you walk out that door with more information, feeling more informed and more energized to be a part of what's going on in this community. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, with that, um, any parting remarks? I, I would not, I would be remiss if I did not say, uh, James, on behalf of the Historic Southside Neighborhood Association, we meet the second Monday at the Southside Community Center at 6 o'clock. Second Monday of each month at the Southside Community Center. Anything else for the good and order? First off, let's give it up for Lorraine. Let's give it up for y'all. This is true dedication. And I want to just articulate one more thing about some of the questions that was asked. It's so important when, we, when Royal Capital came, we made a commitment with the city of Fort Worth that we was going to be very committed to working in this partnership. And so when we talk about making sure minority uh, contractors happen, one of the things that we don't always talk about is when we got that list of a thousand people, uh, me and Robert looked at that list and we saw no names from the city, of, from Fort Worth and black contractors. And we instructed them to go back out. And so I want to let the community know that it's not just their job to make sure it happened, it's the city of Fort Worth job to make sure it happened, and it's also our community job to make sure it happened. And so we're going to do our part. We need to make sure that you're willing to do your part. And so we look forward to seeing you guys on that Wednesday. I'm, I don't know who keeps scheduling meetings on Wednesday because I mentioned church tonight. But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, that's just, that's just threw that out there. But I, I'm here. I'm dedicated to it. So thank you all for coming out. Thank you all for being involved.